is Ann Smith, and once again I'm here representing two nonprofits, Africans United and Project Bazia. Uh, today we have a new face to interview. Uh, his name is Lawrence Okeo, and he's originally from Kenya. And uh, why don't I start by asking Lawrence to tell us a little bit about his life? Uh, growing up as a young man in Kenya? Well, um, and I just want to say thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this uh, Project Bus your presentation today. Um, I know that this, I wouldn't take this for granted. <laughs> oh, thank you. And, uh, You're uh, welcome. So, um, growing up in Kenya, you know, as um, a boy, I grew up between my parents. Uh, I am the firstborn, and uh, my my father and my mother. Uh, my father's name is Sabian Okeyo, and my mom's name is uh, Jane Arusa, Jane Akongo. Uh, we would actually um, would actually come to have eight children. Uh, eight children. And um, it became, being a firstborn became a caring job <laughs> for the rest of the other, other kids. So um, you grew up helping your mom and doing little farm work. My father could say that he's a peasant farmer. And my mom simply take care of us in so many different ways. Sometimes uh, doing, going to the local market, buying fish from Lake Victoria, and uh, getting them ready and uh, w taking them to uh, another local market, pretty much walking on foot. Uh. Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up seeing my parents truly work hard uh, to be able to take care of us and uh, the rest of other kids. Let me interrupt a second. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did you live in a village, what you would call a village, or did you live in the city? Um, I grew up typically in a village. Uh, I typically grew up in a village, um, uh, part of western Kenya, down on the shores of Lake Victoria, uh, very close at the borders of uh, uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Okay. Mm. okay. And so you went to school there. Um, tell us a little bit about the educational system in, in Kenya, because I know Malawi has quote, free public schools <laughs> for everybody, but there are uh, practically no materials to work with. So a free school without books, paper, pencils, uh, just buildings, mm -hmm. um, oh, that's something. Mm -hmm. But in Kenya, is, 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 is public school, what public school is here, that is anything <clears throat> is given to you? Um, in Kenya, we have had, um a number of developments, uh, I would say, compared to many African countries. Uh, but during the time I went to school in 1980s, uh, pretty much there was no free school. The parents had to take care of the school fees from from the primary levels to to high school to a two-year college in Kenya. We call it for a diploma, uh, and then. They would continue like that. If your son or daughter uh, were to go to a university, you had to pay school fee. But later on, the, um, we have seen development and changes in, uh, in Kenya system of education, um, where uh, we uh, uh, politicians and religious leaders, uh, they begin to demand that uh, primary education uh, become free. So with the Kenyan new constitution, which is now almost 12 years or 10 or 12 years, um, uh, primary education is free in Kenya. And not many countries, I think, around the world uh, um, are blessed to have that. So I would say that Kenya has really made a big, a big, um, uh, I would say, a milestone. So, <clears throat> but that's what we call secondary school, high school, there are fees. Absolutely. So in Kenya, until today, um, when you, um, uh, children are going to uh, high school, 
they have to put, I would say, a total of 50,000 US dollar a year for an average, um, uh, no, 50,000, not really US dollar, I'm sorry, but 50,000 Kenya shilling, which is like, um, that would be pretty much like, um, 500, uh, 500 to six, 600, 500 to 600 uh, dollars a year. Plus that is American, pretty much ex American dollars. Wow. American dollars. Yeah. And that is pretty much very expensive for a peasant farmer like my family uh, to be able to put that every year. Especially mm. with eight, with eight, you know, eight children, and you did, did you, and your, so your family made enormous sacrifices every time a child came to the age of high school. <clears throat> it was enormous um, sacrifice, um, just for any family in Kenya. That is an enormous uh, sacrifice. Um, um, I mean, just thinking of the the monthly wages or salary, uh, where you know. Uh, two hundred and fifty dollars becomes a salary of uh, uh, someone like uh, I don't think teachers actually make uh, make more than uh, two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars uh, a month. A month. Yeah. So you can imagine <laughs> how, the, how enormous that sacrifice would be uh, for a father who is not even a teacher, who is not um, who is not. Um, uh, you know, uh, on the professional jobs, accountant, uh, I would, uh, would have to stretch in order to actually take care of these fees. I, I like <clears throat> to talk about this particular issue in Africa uh, because I hope every now and then that will be someone in uh, our audience who is attending public school right now, <clears throat> perhaps a high school student. And um, if they don't know that they are one of the blessed, because you are blessed to get a free 12-year education in this country. Uh, I mean, I just, I used to teach, and I used to say to them, this is the only free education you're ever going to get, unless you're really fortunate and get a massive scholarship of some kind. So you better make use of it. And of course, you know, they're children. Absolutely. Their children, so it's very hard for them to recognize what a blessing this is. And um, while we're on the subject, this is also why my friend Bazia, whom you've met on previous shows, and I write books which we donate to these schools, because in most countries, and I assume in Kenya, English is one of the things that is taught in public school, um, the materials for teaching English are they have to come from outside of Africa. The people there are not writing books for schools in, uh, in English, in Africa. So you have someone who already is not a native speaker of English, uh, living in, in, living in uh, teaching in Africa, and they have no materials that are written in good English, except what perhaps they bought from either the UK or the United States. And those books are about things that African children don't know anything about. Uh, I'm, I'm plugging our book, Necessary Gifts, which is about the first week of a young man named Gift uh, at a <laughs> private school. Very good. And uh, well, I actually stole the name from our taxi driver in Malawi. <laughs> he, he was Gift. The Gift, uh, OK. So anyway. Um, Anyway, I want to say that this this kind of book is why why we get to how we get to know someone like Lawrence because we talk to him. We say, "What's going on in your in the country you came from? Are they writing good books for kids to use in school?" Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so you finished, you graduated from high school, um, and you wanted to do more. Can you give me yes. a kind of general picture of your goals at that point and what you would have had to do? in Kenya to get them? A lot of changes are going on. At some point, uh, it looks like Kenya will be able to afford, um, will be able to mandate and declare high school free. Again, that, is, that would be such a, a huge political development many Kenyans are actually looking forward to. And um, it was a challenge for me to um, eventually go through 
um, uh, the system of education and the adults of life uh, and to be able to travel to come to the United States and continue with the uh, education. Um, I mean, I would say some of the things happen because of uh, divine connection. Um, you, need, you, you begin to meet people when there is a purpose in life. It looks like there is um, a divine connection that can easily happen. Or I would say, um, yeah, let me, I think it is just um, miraculous connections, you know, something you did not plan. So you meet people where the teachers and the connection begins and the interest develops and people begin to recognize to recognize your possibility, your potential, and they begin to see you. Why would you consider traveling um, to overseas for further education? Uh, and that is exactly what happened with me. Um, it is something that I never, I never, um, I never could actually plan and uh, be able to see materialize. But I got to work with um, a youth with a mission. It's a ministry, uh, an international Christian ministry, trans missionaries, and send them around the world. So I happened to work with the national office in Nairobi, and later on that office was moved to Eldoret. And mostly my work was to receive majority of young Americans and some young Europeans, and some could come even as far as uh, China. They would come for uh, holidays and uh, travels uh, 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 to do travels in Kenya, and vacations, missions. And um, I was trained by the ministry to organize them and be able to um, travel with them more or less like a tour guide, but we were so much into ministry. Um, so it is through that connection that I met a lady called uh, Rebecca Nu. Uh, Rebecca knew, and uh, she was en she was engaged with a man called uh, um, what is what's the what's the husband's name? But we met during that time. <laughs> I just seen their their son's uh, birthday, uh, Doran, and uh, who was just under sixteen years old. I mean, it's just it's wonderful. Um, but they came to Kenya, and they did the connection for me to come over and continue with my education in YWAM, Youth to the Mission, uh, on their campus base in uh, uh, Tyler, Texas. Okay. Yeah. So from there, the, the, the interest would further deepens, uh, would mm -hmm. further deepens, and the desire to, uh, to achieve started from there. So I went to a theological seminary in Jacksonville, Texas, and did Bachelor of Art and uh, uh, Religion there there. During that time also did the junior college for two years uh, at Jackson uh, JBC, uh, Jackson Baptist uh, College. And then from there, uh, bachelor degree was not enough. Moved on to get, um, uh, to be admitted at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, main campus. And I did my master's um, in divinity there, uh, philosophical studies and uh, theology. Mm. I, I want to kind of hitch back a tiny bit because I didn't ask you this question when we met a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, what would you say is your big goal? Uh, a Catholic minister or priest. Okay. That was the initial um, desire that I would say really shaped me and informed me um, to uh, to want to be uh, to become to grow up to become a priest or a minister, mm -hmm. and I think it is because uh, the first people that uh, I saw in my life are uh, professional um, uh, are people I could model uh, model after on the bushes on the bush bush of Kenya, yes. the shores of Lake Victoria, were the Catholic missionaries who were coming mm -hmm. down there. Okay. Uh, some of them from Italy. Uh, running the parishes down there, but um, from the parish they send young African missionaries, uh, seminarians. seminarians. They would come down to reach their own people. And uh, I was observing as a little kid, a little boy, and looking at the young African seminarians, really uh, uh, something that really enticed me and I admired, and I begin to look after them. 
uh, begin to want to be like them okay. and I realized that it was all to do with they God. They were your role models. It, they became my role model. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to you um, to Tyler, Texas, <clears throat> and and you now are you are now a doctor of divinity. You have all the degrees you could possibly need. <laughs> and so, what do you want to do at this point? Well, uh, I would like to correct you a little bit. Okay, um, I do, do have um, a master's of divinity. A master's of um, divinity. I okay. do have a master's of divinity. I know majority of people have this misunderstanding about the um, about the concentration in theological studies. But um, Masters of Divinity is one of the major uh, theological concentration. And, um, but it, you study many things. So you study many things. Um, you do study many things when, when you are doing something like Masters of Divinity. Um, on top of Masters of Divi Divinity is a, a doctor of ministry. Okay. So a doctor of ministry is just like, after Master of the Divinity leaves you with something like 25 to 27 credit hours uh, to be able to, to become a, a doctor of ministry. Doctor of ministry is not academic, it's not an um, academic degree, it is an experiential degree. Okay. It is an experience that brings you with a number of few hours again in school. So it is pretty much, doctor of ministry is pretty much um, is pretty much a Master's of Divinity. Okay. Um, but on top of all of that, there is educational um, degree um, um, of, um, um, on religious studies. We call it uh, Doctor of Philosophy. Okay. So that is way, way um, another four years after your four years of Master's of Divinity. So um, mostly for those who are called to go and work, uh, uh, be professors, be teachers in the universities, they would be required to have um, a doctor of philosophy. So I did not want uh, to go further. I wanted to be a, more of a community leader, of which most of that training was done during my uh, Master's of Divinity Studies. Uh -huh. okay. mm. So you wanted to actually get out into the world, so to speak, I believe the academic world, and go into the world and help help people uh, find their spiritual depths. I think that, that that's a simple way of putting yes, it. Yes. I, mean, I think a lot of people think of uh, min missionaries or pastors as being, I'm just going to say an American bias. A lot of us are suspicious when we meet someone like this. We think, oh, he's going to try to make me believe what he believes. <laughs> um, and that, that was never your purpose. Your purpose was to draw out what was already there, I think. The, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> so my goal, just like I told you, my, my initial desire was to well, I look after these Catholic seminarians, and of which they led me into seminary. But I would never become a Catholic priest, as you know that I am married with uh, four kids. Uh, my wife is that, Lillian. That stop that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, Lillian and my, uh, my, my eldest daughter, we, of whom I've adopted, uh, I adopted by virtue of marriage, is Lisa. And Deborah is my own biological kid, Deborah. And Uriel is the last one, but we are also expecting one on the way, uh, who is, will be a boy, have girls. So, um, so I just wanted to say that I never had to become a Catholic priest. <laughs> they don't have kids. That's true. <laughs> but, um, so the desire was to become a community leader. So it is, you know, ministry is intertwined with working, serving in the community. So while you are thinking of becoming a priest, uh, it may come in a different way. You, be, you still go on to get the same kind of trainings, but the work actually is done in the community. So I think the greatest call that I had in my life was to serve in the community, both political and religious. So religious and political kind of, you know, join together mm -hmm. serving the people mm -hmm. on the ground here. Mm. Mm. But that meant you wanted to become uh, a minister here and get your Doctor of Divinity, um, which you didn't do. Yeah, so most of my adult education uh, were done um, in the United States. So majority of people, especially my uh, present client, they don't 
they do not understand my background. I came here a little bit earlier than most of the new arrivals. I came here, I would say, um, 2004. That is my first time in the United States. Okay. And um, um, mostly my time was spent in, uh, in educational uh, institutions. Um, so three years of a bachelor degree, four years of Masters of Divinity in the biggest city in Dallas, uh, Texas. Um, and then after that, you know, so, um, <clears throat> but the goal, um, the, since most of those theological, I mean, religious studies were done here and experience and practice, my goal, therefore, would be automatic, would be to pursue uh, ordination. So I begin the idea of wanting to pursue ordination um, to become United a minister States. here in the United States with the United Methodist Church in Texas. Mm. Okay. But you were not able to do that. Yes, yeah, so this is kind <laughs> like of the a way tricky, you put it. But subject. I couldn't be able to do it. I, um, so when you are preparing for, when you become a candidate, so we use the word candidate, when you become a candidate for ordination in the United, in the United Methodist Church, let me just talk particularly about the, the polity in the United mm -hmm. Methodist Church. Um, you go through candidacy, which may last begin from one year to three years. During that time, you are expected to write a lot of doctrinal statements and to be able to articulate your call and why you believe that you got the grace and uh, the gift uh, uh, to serve, particularly in the United Methodist Church. Now, um, it is a rigor of preparation after your theological studies. It is like the doctrinal studies you did in your school in, this, in, oh the, in the theology. <laughs> you have to come and write them for the United Methodist Church elders. And from there, uh, they will decide if they will move you forward. So there is candidacy um, uh, uh, in, in the first year, second year, third year. You are supposed to do a presentation before the Board of Ordained Ministry. Of the um, of the district panel, um, the the uh, DS, a district superintendent is mm -hmm. this is the is the cabinet um, is the bishop bishop's eye there is the one who make it in the uh, bishop's cabinet. So from there they would decide to push take you further um, for ordination. Um, so you become a member of annual conference. Okay. Uh, if they don't move you, you don't become. I attempted, uh, I was told to prepare the first, in my third year, I did the first one. I went, I wasn't, they wouldn't let me continue uh, to the candidacy, I mean, to, to become a member of annual conference. I did again for the second time, and it also, uh, it was of the same objection. And the objection was simply, uh, the DS told me, and the panel told me what the DS said. Um, the district superintendent and the conference there, uh, I think they were more, mostly inspired by the, uh, by the district superintendent. Um, they thought that uh, the um, um, Texas and particularly some areas of Texas were not ready to have uh, um, <laughs> an African, an African minister. A minister. And mm. they, they therefore gave me an option that I would be ordained, I would be moved forward to be ordained under condition that immediately after the nation, I would go back to Kenya. That was such a challenge. And um, eventually, um, just to summarize the idea, um, eventually I couldn't, I couldn't um, actually become a member of annual conference in Texas. Mm -hmm. Wow. How disturbing. Mm, yeah. I, 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 mm -hmm. I don't want to dwell on this because the reason I'm very excited to have you here today mm -hmm. is how you handled the, what must have been an incredible disappointment. It is. I mean, you deal with things the way they come. And um, while I did not make it to become um, ordained minister in Texas Annual Conference, it did not stop my spiritual growth, and it did not stop me seeing myself as a minister. Um, 
I continue to minister uh, to people. Even now, I'm doing accounting services, you know, and uh, doing taxes and things that I've told you, uh, bookkeeping, writing okay. financial okay. statements. Let's, let's stop a minute, because I think I, th I want our audience to catch what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had planned to go the route that one would expect someone to follow given these goals. Yes. And you followed it for how many years after uh, high school? After high school, uh, candidacy went for like uh, almost six years. Okay, so for six years, mm -hmm. and that doesn't include your college and all the other things you did building up to that, It right? doesn't include, it may go alongside when you are right. going through your... Um, right. uh -huh. So for at least, let's say, 10 years after uh -huh. high school, uh -huh. you were determined, you were working towards it, and then you found the door was closed. The door was closed. For reasons that I'm not even going to go into discussing because mm -hmm. uh, it'll make my blood pressure go <laughs> up. No, it infuriates me. Um, but then mm -hmm. I come from a different denomination that I don't think would have said the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know, though. Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you saw something. This is, this is what um, excited me so much about our meeting. Mm -hmm. You saw that you could do what you wanted to do no matter what you were doing to support your family. Absolutely. So now you have an accounting business, mm -hmm. right? Yes, small um, accounting firm. Okay. Uh, why don't you quickly tell our audience a little bit about that because we're almost out of time. Absolutely. So I just want to summarize. I know we are out of time, uh, but it did not change. Just to finish what I started, it did not change. It, it was just a different platform. Instead of ministering and reaching out uh, the people uh, through the pulpit, and now I'm meeting them in a plain clothes in, uh, as, uh, as in they come office. in yeah. my office as they come to minister, as they, as they come to do their taxes, uh, as they come with the different financial needs depending with their businesses. And uh, I see myself as ministering, helping mostly uh, immigrant communities. Uh, that are here in Maine since 2018 when we moved with my family from Texas to, to, to Maine. Maine. Mm -hmm. And I see this as um, something that almost makes me weep because it is a fulfillment of the way our spiritual life should be. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so many times you think of people who go into the church and I mean, go into the church Sunday morning. They drink the sacred wine. They eat the bread. <laughs> um, I mean, and I've done this myself over the years. Mm -hmm. You go in and you are praying and you are so full of the sense of, of what everything is all about and your purpose in the world. And then everybody gets up, goes, has coffee with each other, walks out the door, <laughs> and it's gone. <laughs> that that almost ecstasy that that belief in how the world should be goes away and you go back to your normal little life uh. <laughs> um, so you got around that mm -hmm. you got around that by saying what the heck <laughs> i'm gonna go ahead and do what i want to do anyway <laughs>